All right, everybody, let's get started. I, I'm going to begin with an apology. I, I uh, decided it would be a good idea to get sick over breaks. As a result, I haven't graded your exam three yet, or I should say I haven't finished grading it. I'm about 70% of the way there, and by and large, it, you know, the grades are going pretty well. Uh, so, But my goal is to have that done by Wednesday. Um, so my apologies. I wanted to come in and have them done, but that just wasn't in the cards. Um, let me get my little clicker plugged in. All right. So this is the last week of the class. So I have a couple of general um, housekeeping items I want to go through with you, and I want to um, review some things with you. So first off, let's talk about grades. Um, so here's just a, a snapshot. Uh, everything up through 6.3 has been graded. 6.4 is being graded, and you've got one homework assignment that's due uh, Wednesday. That is the last um, uh, official homework of the semester. I say official because I do have one bonus assignment for you, but I'll, I'll mention that here in a bit. Um, I'm going to bring up this at-home game spreadsheet here in a sec. I'm going to send this out to you all via email sometime today, uh, but I'll, I'll explain what that is here in a bit. But this is sort of the uh, where we're at uh, with everything today. And what I want to do for the next couple slides is talk about the remaining housekeeping for the class because I want you all to know where we're at and where we're headed. Okay, so uh, attendance grades. All right, the attendance grades for everything up until now is up to date and current in Blackboard. There's three more lectures remaining today and then Wednesday and Friday. So once I get those attendance grades, um, you know, collated and whatnot, I'll post those uh, as soon as they're done. And you'll understand why I'm going through all this here in a second. All right, let's talk about homework assignments. Okay, everything through 6.3 is graded. Uh, 6.4 is currently being graded. I say solutions being graded, but with that, what I should have said is solutions posted. So, whoops. Whoops. Okay, I meant solutions posted. We have one more homework assignment, which is the homework assignment with problems involving friction. Uh, that's due on Wednesday. And I have one bonus assignment, which is for you to do the, um, uh, the, the course eval. And so the way that I do this is I want you to complete the course eval. And again, you can say whatever, or you can say whatever you want. You can say I'm the, the worst professor ever, but I do want you to do it. Uh, and if you upload a screen capture of your dashboard showing that you just did it, I don't want to see what you wrote. I just want to see that you did it. I will give you 10 bonus homework points on top of your homework average. Okay. So I put a link for that uh, in uh, Blackboard so you can access the survey there. Um, again, I just want to see you do it. If there's anything in this class that you um, think should be improved, I, I do take that to heart. I'll, and I'll give you an example of that. My very first semester teaching uh, steel design, which is an upper level uh, civil class, I used a PowerPoint theme that had um, blue slides. The background was blue and the text was white. Uh, and back then I would be printing out uh, slide handouts and giving them to everybody. I wasn't really using Blackboard as much as I do now. Um, but I got a lot of comments on the course evals about the printouts because when they printed out, the slides were gray. And so when students would write on them with their pencil, they couldn't read their writing. So they said, you've got to change the background on your slides. Uh, that's a really good point. And so now you can see, see what I do. And so that, that, that seemed to work. I, I really do take the, the, the feedback to heart. So if there's any improvements that you would suggest, I, I really do want to hear it. But if you do it, I will uh, give you 10 bonus points on top of your homework average. So could you theoretically get a homework average over 100%? Yes, you could. Okay. So, uh, so I, and I'm perfectly fine with that. Okay. Let's talk about the lectures. So today we're going to have a lecture with problems involving friction. Um, that's a typo. These dates are typos. That's supposed to be 28. This is from last year. That's supposed to be... That, yeah, I didn't fix that. All right. So our remaining lecture schedules, we have the problems involving friction. We have our comprehensive course review and our Q&A session for exam four. So what I mean by these two lectures is what I'm going to do on, uh, what I'm going to do on lecture 40 is I'm going to basically go through the entire class. Um, everything that we've done from beginning to end and then lecture 41 is really a chance for you all to go through anything you have regarding the class or regarding the exam. If you have some particular problems in the past that were confusing that you'd like me to go through, we can do them in class together. But, you know, basically what I'm doing is I'm taking the review session and I'm splitting it over two lectures since the, the class is comprehensive or the exam is comprehensive. 
<clears throat> the exam is Monday. That is correct. The exam is Monday, December 5th uh, at 8 a.m. Um, it's similar logistics of previous exams. It's just going to be longer because it's a comprehensive exam. I designed the exam to be 100 minutes long. Even the, My thought is um, this class meets for 50 minutes, so the exam should be double that. Even though we're given two hours, I designed the exam to be 100 minutes long. So, you know, I use my rule of three. I take that and divide it by three. So I have to be able to do the exam uh, in that much time. So <clears throat> it is comprehensive and it does include friction. So basically everything on the last three exams plus uh, friction. I'm not uh, designing this exam to be incredibly challenging. I would argue that this exam probably includes the simplest components from each of the three previous exams, not the ones that are the most tricky. OK, uh, and that is remaining housekeeping on the class. Now, the only other thing I did want to mention is um, uh, I did want to mention is this thing called the at home game. So I had a buddy in grad school who used to call this playing the at home game. So what he would do is he would uh, take the syllabus and he would uh, take all of his, you know, pending grades and he would say, OK, what do I need to get on the final to get, the, get an A or get a B or get a C? So he called that playing the at home game. So I developed this spreadsheet that I'm going to send everybody. Um, uh, at some point today that will show you what you need to get on the final to get a certain grade. So like, for example, these are some random values here, but let's say you're a student and you have, I don't know, a perfect homework uh, or a perfect attendance grade. Your homework average is, let's say, an 89. Um, you got an 86 on the first exam. The second exam, maybe that didn't go so well, but the third exam, let's say you got a 73 then it'll tell you, I mean, I, the, the point I want to show you with this is that you're guaranteed at least a, a C. You need to get this to get a B. Um, the A is out of the cards, but there's a, hell of a, um, there's a hell of a range on the final exam. So, like, for example, if I go back to this set of data that I entered in before, so for this random student, whoever this is, okay, they need to get an 82.6 on the uh, final to get a B but they need to get a 15.9 to get a C. So there's a really big range uh, on the final. And, and really that's, that's meant to give you a little bit of comfort. The idea is that, you know, the, as I've said before, any one exam doesn't have that, that much of an impact on the final grade uh, overall. So any one grade really isn't going to affect things uh, that much at the end of the day. The long story short is that I don't really want you to stress about that. And I want you to kind of understand where your grade uh, is coming from. Does that make sense? All right, I'll send this out uh, a little bit later today. But any questions? Yes? So a minute ago you had said that the uh, final would be 100 minutes. Will we still get all two hours? Oh, of course, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. I designed it to be a little shorter to give everybody some wiggle room. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, of course. <clears throat> yeah, the university gave you two hours, you're getting every, every bit of those two hours. Now, I'll say, now, I will say this, okay? I would normally be okay with giving you a couple extra minutes. The only issue for me with Monday is that I also have an exam at 10.15. <laughs> so I have to run over and give another two-hour exam right after this. So, so I, I kind of have to end it at 10. But I will be here that morning ready to go at 8 a.m. Does that sound good? Now, one thing I will do, we will have a, 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 an FCAR survey done uh, at that point in the class, but I'll have that on a QR code, and you can do that sort of at your own time. I won't, I won't let, I'll try and make sure that doesn't eat up uh, exam time. Everybody good? All right, well, then let's begin our last topic in the class, which is uh, to close up friction. So hopefully everybody uh, had a chance to watch the, uh, <coughs> the pre-recorded lecture I had. And you saw the uh, example problem that I had involving Yoshi. Did everybody see that? Everybody like Yoshi? I like Yoshi. So, all right. So, ultimately, that lecture was about um, the concept of static and kinetic friction. And so, in the land of statics, there are two sort of constant um, values that we're going to uh, need to assess for pretty much any friction problem, which is the force required to begin motion and the force that's generated during motion, okay? So I'm calling that F sub M and F sub K. F sub, and both of those are the normal force 
which is the uh, total amount of force that is perpendicular or normal to the plane under consideration multiplied by an appropriate coefficient of friction. Now what you will find is that for pretty much any uh, 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 contact between two dry surfaces that the coefficient of static friction is larger than the coefficient of kinetic friction. So for example, if I had this table, it is more difficult to get it to start moving than it is to keep it moving, okay? And this is a very rough rule of thumb, but traditionally your kinetic friction is about 75% of your static friction, okay? <clears throat> These constants are pretty much lookups uh, dependent upon the, um, the, contact, uh, the, the two surfaces that are in contact. Sometimes these uh, uh, constants are specified by uh, particular codes and, and standards. So, for example, I, I, and I, I, my apologies to keep referring back to civil engineering, but in the land of steel design, um, sometimes we have uh, bolted connections that we design in order to rely on that friction. So some of you might have gone on the, uh, the tour for the uh, I-64 Nitro Bridge did anybody go on that tour? How many went on that tour? A couple of you went on that tour. Um, those bolts uh, were installed. You, uh, the, the name for those connections are what are called slip critical connections. And slip critical connections are ones that rely on the friction generated between the two plates in order to develop the capacity of the connection. And when you compute the capacity of those bolts, you are essentially doing a mu in calculation. You actually look up the mu value. And so if you have dry or unpainted steel, the mu value is 0.3. And so you, you just look it up. So, um, but the point is like in it, what I'm getting at for, for your purposes in this class is that mu will either be something that's given to you or something that you may need to solve for, but it's not something that you're just going to have to just guess. Okay. Now, the normal force um, is obviously important to the land of friction. Um, the term normal, I'm just talking, when I say normal, I mean perpendicular to the plane under consideration. And so I want to be clear that the normal force is the sum of all the components that are normal to this plane. Okay, And so what I mean by that is if I'm looking at, for example, this problem, this P force is, is uh, not only generating a component that's perpendicular to the plane, but also the weight of the box. Okay, So you can think of N as sort of like the reaction, right? If there's all these forces going down, what's reacting up to keep the system in equilibrium in this direction? So what we're going to do for a problem like this is we're going to split W into its X and Y components, but I've got X and Y in parentheses because really what we're going to think about with X and Y is this. We're not going to think of X and Y as just, you know, we're not going to think of it like this. We're not going to think of you know, this is X and this is Y. We're going to think of X and Y aligned with the situation at hand, aligned with the, uh, the coordinates of the, the, uh, the free body diagram, okay? So that's why I say X and Y components. And then when I, I find that when you split this into X, into its quote unquote X and Y components, that the problem actually ends up being pretty easy to solve, okay? Now, the one thing you have to be a little careful about is that when you're dealing with inclined surfaces, you have to go back to a little bit of um, algebra and recognize that when you're dealing with trig and you're dealing with X and Y components, that if you're dealing with the forces that are normal to the plane, sometimes you have to flip your X and Y components. Um, the reason that you're flipping them, it goes back to this. So if you remember from algebra, if you take a line and you want to find the slope of the line that is perpendicular to it or normal to it, you're basically just taking the line and, and flip, or the slope and flipping it. So for example, if you have a line with a slope of two thirds, the line perpendicular to that has a slope of three halves or negative three halves because you got to flip the direction. Okay. So like as an example, to kind of give you something that might be a little more relevant to what we're talking about here, if I have a surface here, let's say this is on a, 5, 12 incline, right? So the hypotenuse is 13, right? So if we're talking about this angle right here, the sine of this angle is 5 over 13, and the cosine is 12 over 13. But notice how I have 12 over 13 associated with the y, and 5 over 13 associated with the x. Like, is that a typo? No, it's not a typo. 
It's because I'm dealing with those forces that are perpendicular. Okay, so I'm flipping the direction of the, uh, the coefficients. And if this seems a little esoteric, don't worry, we're going to have an example that we go through this here in a second. So far, so good? Again, again, I think that things are always a little easier when you have an example to go off of. So let's go off of an example. All right. So I have here a crate that is on an incline. Okay. Now, I have a crate. The crate weighs 300 pounds. Okay. And it's placed on an incline plane. Uh, and there's also a 100 pound force that is pushing up. Okay. Now, I want to determine whether or not this crate is in equilibrium. And I want to determine, regardless of whether or not it's in equilibrium or not, I want to determine what is the value of the friction that's being generated between these two surfaces. Now, as you're writing this down, I'll say a couple things. Um, <coughs> first off, sorry, <coughs> excuse me. First off, this 300-pound load, that is a weight. Okay, so what that means is that this 300 pound load is acting directly downward. Okay, it's acting directly downward. Okay, but our X and Y coordinate system is sort of going to be going this way. Okay, so we're going to take this 300 pound load and split it up into X and Y components. Okay, we just need to be careful about how we do that. Okay, um, we can also, and, and so we're going to do this problem. We're also going to maybe game out some potential scenarios later, okay? One problem that I do kind of like to do sometimes in this class is, okay, here's an object on a table. How high does the angle need to be before friction gets overcome and it starts sliding? So that's an interesting problem to consider uh, as well. All right, with me so far? Okay, now, the first thing I wanna do before we start um, diving too far into this is let's just deal with the trig first, okay? So I wanna look at this angle, okay? I wanna look at this angle right here, okay? So we'll just, we'll just call this trig components. Can somebody tell me what is the cosine of that angle? I'm sure somebody's saying, wait a minute, don't you need to take the inverse tangent to find the angle and then take the cosine? No, you don't. Sakatoa, tell me. Three fifths. Three fifths. That's exactly right. It is adjacent over hypotenuse. It's that simple. What's that? Sorry, you're right, you're right. You're right, four fifths. Whoops. It's the sign. That's three fifths. I'll take the blame for that one, sir. I'll take I'll take the blame for it. We'll add 0.12 to the mistake counter. We're still not at seven yet. Although, those typos on the slide that I had, yeah, that probably adds a little bit more. We're probably getting close. All right, so what I wanna do now is I wanna recognize that we're going to want to use a coordinate system that looks like this, okay? So our 100 pound force is already oriented along that coordinate system. So I don't really need to do anything with that right now. But I do want to ask, what is this and what is this? So let's see about that. All right, 
So let's see, 300 times four fifths, what is that? Uh, 60 times four, 240. That's 180. Did I do that right? Am I good? Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So now. Let's draw a free body diagram. Okay, let's see if we can do, do something with this. All right. All right. So here's my plane, okay? And I'm going to draw an outline of my box. There's my box right there, okay? Now, 300 pounds acts downward, okay? 300 pounds acts downward. But I want to split that up into X and Y components, okay? All right. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, here's, let's say here's the center of the box or, or what have you. Let's say this. is 240, and this is 180. Now, let's think about that. First off, let's look at the directions. Why do I have the direction going down and this way? Well, here's the box. If I take the plane and I lift it up, it's obviously acting down the plane because the box wants to slide down the plane, right? So that weight is causing the box to want to slide this way. So that's why I have this going this way and the weight's acting down. If I put a really heavy box here on this, um, here on this table and I lift, I'm having to overcome the weight of that box. So it's obviously acting into it. Now, some of you might be saying, wait a minute, <clears throat> now, Dr. Mike, you've got Let's see, you've got the cosine is 240, but 240 is associated with the vertical. You've got the sine is 180, and the sine is associated towards the horizontal. There's that perpendicular flipping I was talking about, okay? Imagine instead, okay, so let, let's, let's have a little discussion here. Let's, let's, let's look at this over here. So that is, what is that, just for sake of discussion? What is the inverse tangent of 3 over 4? It's like 36 something, am I right? Say it again. 36.9, okay. Now let's let's live in the land that instead of this angle being 36.9, let's say it was two degrees. Very, very, very low slope. So all I'm doing is taking it, lifting it like this. Well, in that land, most of the load is going into the plane. A very small amount is wanting to slide down the plane. So that's another reason why I have the smaller component acting down the plane and the larger component acting towards the plane. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? Now, this free body is not, we're not done with this yet because we got to remember we have a 100 pound force going this way. Now, In order for this box to be in static equilibrium, I need a normal force going like this. And for now, I'm going to write my frictional force like that. Okay? 
And some of you might be thinking, well, how did you get it going like this? Well, let me show you why. Let's do a little bit more statics and let's see if we can look at this from a resultant standpoint, okay? There, if I look at this in terms of X and Y components, if I look at this in terms of X and Y components, there is only one component acting this way. So I'll call this, let's say, RY is 240 pounds. Now, as for force along the x-axis, I have 100 pounds pushing up this way, but I have 180 pounds going down. So in terms of a resultant, my net force going this way is 80 pounds down the ramp. Does everybody see what I did there? That if I got 100 pounds up the ramp and 180 pounds down, I can replace that with just 80 pounds down. Does everybody see that? Okay. And so that's why, okay, if I have, let's say for along the y-axis, if I have 240 pounds going into the ramp, that must be resisted by a normal force pushing back, okay? And if I sum forces in the y direction, and we'll say that, you know, like that's positive, I've got normal force going up, quote unquote up, minus 240 going down, I think that makes sense, right? That's not terribly challenging. Now, now what I'm going to do for static equilibrium's sake is I'm going to say this. Let's just call this F for right now, and, and you'll see why I'm doing that. So actually, let me, let me go ahead and erase that. I don't want to confuse things. Let me go ahead and erase this right here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say So for the box to be in static equilibrium, then these have to be zero as well. Okay? And so I have F going in the positive direction, 80 going down in the negative direction, And so I have that. Okay. So let me let me box these real quick. These are kind of important. Okay. Oh, goodness. All right, so let, let's just recap what we've done here so far. So what we've done is we've taken our free body diagram, we've split it into X and Y components, okay? We figured out resultants, and then we said, okay, let's sum those to determine what these reactions would need to be, okay? Now, the normal force is 240 pounds, just regardless, okay? But notice what I said here. For the box to be in static equilibrium, this needs to be 80 pounds. Does everybody agree with that? Okay. Now, let's look at friction. Okay.
Let's look at the max available static friction. Because remember, the way friction works is we keep generating frictional force until we hit this FM, and then we get a sudden decrease, and then it goes on forever as FK. In other words, this table... I'm pushing, 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 and once I hit FM, it starts moving. And once it starts moving, that force decreases a little bit, and I develop a constant S sub K. So the maximum available frictional force is mu sub S times N. So what was mu sub S? What were we given for this problem? We were given 0.25 and 0.2. So let me write that right here. What is that? 0 0.25 times 240 pounds. So 60 or uh, is that 60? Yeah, I think so. So before we do anything else, what does that mean? Okay, this is the maximum available static friction. Okay. This is the maximum amount of force I can generate between these two planes based on the amount of normal force. Now, what did I say up here? I said for the box to be in static equilibrium, we need a frictional force of 80 pounds. So I guess my question is, is the box in static equilibrium? No, it's moving, right? It is moving, okay? So now let me ask you, a follow-up question. So the problem asks, determine whether the crate is in equilibrium. Is it in equilibrium? No, it's moving. Find the value of the frictional force. How much friction is being developed between these two surfaces in this scenario? I'm asking. No, no, no. If it's moving, the box is moving. Once the box is moving, we generate a constant amount of that. So how much how much friction is generated? There you go. So what I should say, you know, let's do it like this.
me stop for a second and see if this makes sense. Is everybody okay with this? Okay. <clears throat> Let's do some thought experiments, okay? Because, I mean, I, I got to be honest, I, I think in terms of friction, the hardest part is the thought experiments. Again, that's why I had Yoshi to help me with the last lecture, because that's what Yoshi was there to do, was to help us with that. Plus, I couldn't help but show Yoshi again. It's, it's Yoshi. Yoshi's awesome. Um, let, let's see if we can think some things out. Okay, I'm going to ask a little bit of a different question. Okay. So let, let's start off with this first question. What if the 100 pound load wasn't there? Would that help the situation? No, it wouldn't make it worse, right? The box would be moving faster. So would you agree that the 100 pound load is helping us out a little bit? It's not helping us out enough though, but it is helping us out. So let me ask this. What does that load need to be in order to keep the box in equilibrium? Say it again. Okay, so you're saying 132, okay? And I think I know why you're saying that, because you're looking at the 80 and the 48, right? And saying that's the differential, that's the difference. I argue we don't need that much. 120. Because, again, I can have a force right here on my curve that's higher than F sub K, but is not enough to initiate motion. I argue that I only need another 20 pounds. What would happen if I increase this 100 pound force to 120? Well, if I increased it to our 120, this Rx would become 60, which would mean F would become 60, and that would equal F sub M. Does that make sense? Now, if you really want to get fancy with this problem, here's a way of getting fancy. What if the angle of inclination changed? Ooh, that's interesting. <clears throat> what if the angle changed? What is the angle in which motion starts, keeping all the forces the same? Well, if we wanted, we could get really fancy with that. We could say, all right, let's look at it like this. So what happens if we treat the angle as a variable? So in other words, that goes back to this problem right here. At what angle does motion begin? So let's see. So instead of writing this and this as 240 and 180, what I'll do is I'll write it as W cosine, W sine, right? Or tell you what, let's eliminate as much alphabet soup as we can. It's too early for too much alphabet soup. So we know the box weighs 300, so we'll say 300. 300, we do know we have 100 going this way, right? So that's our normal force. That's our frictional force, right? So we can idealize that. Right? <clears throat> and so we can say, all right, Is this more difficult 
nah, just becomes a little bit more alphabet soup. Bring that over there. Normal force. Frictional force, right? So I'm doing the same thing as I did before. I'm just keeping the uh, keeping it symbolic with the angle, right? So summing forces in the y direction. So remember. That's Y, that's X. So the normal force is and then summing forces in the X direction Y'all see what I'm doing? So now I'm just keeping it, I'm doing the exact same thing I did before. I'm just keeping the theta as a variable. So how do we determine what theta needs to be? Well, we know that is a weird W. Let's do better than that. We know that Fm is mu sub Sn. I don't think I can do that one in my head. Or was it 75? That's 75 cosine theta? Did I do that right? So 75 cosine theta. And that has got to be equal to that. Because I have to develop, so the maximum amount of friction has to be what I can develop along my horizontal plane. So just set those two equal to one another and solve. The way that I would solve this problem, honestly, is to, I mean, we're, we're past this being a math class. And by the way, I am not going to make you um, uh, do this type of problem on the exam, so, so don't worry about that. I'm just showing you where this could go. But I'll show you what I would do, because I'm an engineer. So, so let's put a theta here. I don't know, let's make up a value, 20. The left-hand side of the equation is 75 times cosine. Don't forget, you got to convert it to radians. And the right-hand side is... We get that, so, so 25, 30, and so what I would do is, y'all ever used goal seek before? So data, let's see, what if goal seek, actually, set that, to zero by changing that. And that's what your angle needs to be, about 32.9 degrees. So I just couldn't help but show any goal C. I, I had to bring that up.
Don't worry, we're not doing anything like that on the exam. Does that answer kind of make sense? Well, yeah, I mean, the box isn't generating enough friction to prevent sliding, but it's only barely. I mean, what was the actual angle? It was what, 36.9? And we found that if you decrease that angle a little bit, it'll stop sliding. That makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, it comports with, uh, uh, with intuition, I guess you could say. All right, any questions? All right, you have a homework due Wednesday. We're gonna do class review on Wednesday. So get ready for that. I'm going to pull up the code again, but that's all I got. I will see you all on Wednesday.